Hi, um, I'm Manu Bansal. I'm the founder and CEO of Light Up Data. I'm super excited to be talking to you today about uh, data reliability. Um, we are a three-year-old startup uh, solving the data reliability and data quality problem for Fortune 500 customers and others. Um, and this is a great opportunity for me to tell you about the problem, why it matters, and how we could go about solving it. And by the way, great jobs to the Solutions Monday team for putting together such an amazing lineup of speakers and attendees um, into this event. And thank you all for being here. Um, we are running another session later in the day uh, to look deeper into how we solve the problem. Um, in this session, we want to focus on uh, what the problem is, why it matters, and feel free to chime in your questions anytime through this talk. Um, we are here um, responding to your questions live, or we'll find a way to reach you and set up a conversation. So we are light up data. Um, our mission is to enable data teams to deliver high quality data with high reliability. So what I mean by that is um, data that is fit for use by any stakeholder that's touching that data. It could be an internal consumer like an analyst or an exec, or it could be someone external, especially your customer, right? And, and data teams are, there to deliver high quality data. I mean, the, you know, the data stack, if it's doing one thing well, is to serve out good quality data and do that with reliability. Turns out that's actually not that easy, right? So what I want to talk about today is, um, what does bad data look like? Where does data reliability actually break? And what happens when data breaks? And then I want to talk more about why is this not still a solved problem? Right? Why is reliable data not already available to us when we have so much investment going into making our infrastructure reliable. Then kind of look at how we landed where we are today. What's changed in let's say the last five, 10, 15 years because data quality has been around for as long as data is. And so has been data reliability. But what's different about this problem today that we still don't have a solution, right? But that also starts to tell us, uh, tells, uh, uh, tell us what the solution actually needs to look like. And it turns out the problem is actually pretty solvable. Right. But I want to just sketch out what that solution looks like before we end the talk today. And like I said, feel free to keep sending me questions. Um, we can always pause and take questions. So it turns out data is now actually in the critical path of the business. And what that means is broken data directly leads to broken customer experience. Right. So let's start with, I want to kind of start with my own personal journey <clears throat> about how we got into this problem space. So before I was building LightUp, I was building a company called Uhana. Um, we were building predictive analytics for mobile networks. So think customers like AT&T or Telstra. And the idea was that our system could look at all the data coming in into a cell network, like an LT network, process it in real time and extract insights about how the network is behaving, but also use that to predict how the network is going to behave in the next few seconds, minutes or hours. Right? And now you could take this information and apply it for network control. You could apply it for network analytics. You could apply it to plan your capacity better or even to start to tailor services to individual um, cell phone users and applications. So for example, AT&T's network could now be used to behave uh, differently for someone streaming a YouTube video versus someone just trying to make a phone call, right? So there was a, a big idea behind what we were trying to do at Uhana. This company got acquired in 2019 by VMware. Um, so we did do something, something very interesting. And at the, at the heart of this, um, the solution was actually this data pipeline that was processing real-time data at sub-second latency at the scale of the network, right? So what I'm showing you here is just kind of a simplified sketch of what that pipeline looked like. Um, we we're ingesting 3 million events per second over the Kafka bus, which was um, in one case, the entire network of a country. And then we are passing this data through the Apache Heron stream processor. That's the component you see in the middle there, where one copy of data was also going for batch processing into an Apache Spark service. And then we are persisting another copy into hard disk for um, running offline analysis. And this real-time um, stream processor was then spitting out time series metrics into InfluxDB, which were powering, that's a time series database. And that was powering our dashboards for real-time network visibility as well as control applications that were layered on top of the Uhana stack, right? So this is all well and good. Um, 
And, you know, and I kind of look back at the pipeline there, and this was a realization, even when we were building that company, um, you know, we solved some very interesting, very hard problems. And not surprisingly, one of those was the whole machine learning predictive intelligence on top of the cellular data coming in, which was a very, very strong combination of domain expertise as well as machine learning expertise. And we considered ourselves to be the experts of, of, of that analysis. And that's something that we were very proud of accomplishing, but it was also something that we knew we could solve, which is why we started the company. The other piece was building this real-time infrastructure um, for processing data at scale. And that wasn't trivial either um, with the numbers you just saw, processing 3 million events per second at sub-second latency. But that's something we did understand. We had the components for in place and we could hire expertise for. The kind of hard problem that, that still stayed open even when the company exited was data reliability. We could do a lot to make the infrastructure reliable. We were able to put machine learning models into production and, and they often tend to be simple, right? But they would work. The part that was not in our control was the quality of data coming into the system. And then finally, the results that were being generated out of that data all the way to the customer. And so we would frequently end up in this scenario where we would get an angry phone call from the customer who would come in and say, your system is predicting ridiculous performance on the network, saying you can download a movie at a gigabit per second on your cell device. I mean, that's physically impossible, right? Um, and why was, why was the system saying that? Because the customer decided to change the way they were feeding in raw data into our system. Um, they would just move kilobits per second into bits per second and not bother to inform us, right? So now this is a garbage in garbage out problem where the data has moved in its specification and our system is still expecting it to be the old type. So this was actually not an isolated incident um, or, or a problem unique to Uhana. So that's when I started looking around um, and, uh, and talked to people across different verticals and realized that this is a problem that is actually everyone's problem now and, has, and is becoming more and more so every single day. As you're starting to be data-driven, right? Um, it doesn't matter what vertical you are in, whether you are a retailer, you are a food chain, um, you are a payments provider, data is actually front and center to customer experience and bad data means broken business. So here's an example from one of our customers. This is a Fortune 500 retailer um, who uses data every week and every day to decide what to stock in their inventory. And if this data turns out to be broken on Friday, that's actually the last minute for deciding what goes in the store on a Monday. And so guess what that means? Now the entire team is actually going to spend the whole weekend trying to repair data in time so they can make the right decision. Otherwise they're going to actually lose sale volume because of misstocking inventory on Monday, right? Here's another example. This is coming from, again, a Fortune 500 food chain um, who now um, runs loyalty program across the United States. And this, this customer actually is strongly reliant on those user accounts for, for personalized marketing and personalized offers. Right. And so now this whole program depends um, on being able to bring back every single transaction that's happening in the store or through the mobile app. And now if they start to lose transactions, this is something that actually happens more frequently than, than anyone would care to admit, where transactions would just stop coming in. And, and this would not strike across, across the entire um, you know, store base, because that's something that you would notice right away. But the hard part about the problem is that on any given day, let's say 1% or 3% of your stores are actually not feeding back data or are dropping some, um, some data on the way. So now if you're dropping transactions, it means that your users, your end consumers are actually not getting awarded their loyalty points that they should have earned. And so now this is a direct fiduciary violation from this provider's point of view, right? And you can imagine there's a direct financial implication here because the consumer can ask for a compensation back. But then this starts to be even a bigger problem because you're now losing marketing points. You're failing to personalize your campaigns. You're failing to actually ex extract all the value out of this user. And that's worse, ex worse experience for this user at the end of the day, right? And so all these loyalty points um, need to be accounted for and any gaps need to be picked up as soon as possible. 
Here's another example, which is a Fortune 500 payments provider, um, which is processing payments for um, millions of merchants on the platform. And there have been instances where data is not reaching the bank. So, so the payments provider has actually completed the transaction from their point of view and declared it completed to the merchant. Uh, but the data actually never reached the bank, so the fulfillment never took place. So the money is not disbursed. At the end of the day, there's a reconciliation error, um, which means that the merchant can now actually make a charge back. And now the payments provider has to make up for that gap. Right? So again, a huge, uh, huge, huge uh, financial liability and opens up the payments provider to a lot of risk liability. But it also means that errors like this can creep in all the way to auditors. And now you can get fined for lacking compliance, right? So I could go on and on about those scenarios. Um, airlines mispricing their tickets, um, you know, or ride sharing services, mispredicting how long the ride will take to arrive and so on. Um, but what that tells you is that data is now actually on the critical path of customer experience, right? Yet we are ending up with broken data. And that means broken customer experience. That's bread and butter for the business, right? So let's kind of understand um, why is this the case? Why, why do we still have a broken data problem despite so much investment into making the infrastructure reliable, right? I mean, we have tools for logging, we have tools for monitoring, we have best practices for DevOps, we have tools for incident management and whatnot, right? Yet, as those examples just showed you, um, we are still ending up with broken data. Clearly, making the infrastructure reliable alone is not enough, right? That can still lead to broken data. So that's a fact. But why is that the case, right? So let's kind of understand first, what does data quality or data reliability even mean, right? All of those instances that I just talked about, um, there's one or the other of the following kinds of, in, of, of an issue, right? The customer is asking, is the data making it to my Redshift cluster or not, right? So if transactions are not making it to your data lake, well, infrastructure might still be healthy, but maybe something else is broken with data capture or the content of data coming in. And that's not a problem that infrastructure monitoring tools are even able to pick out for you, right? Is the data arriving on time to your, to your data warehouse, right? If data is getting delayed, for this particular batch of processing, it might just appear as data not being present at all, right? Or if a customer's experience is being personalized out of the last batch of data, which got delayed, then they're going to end up with a misfire, right? Are you getting all the right fields in your event stream? Because now you have something like Fivetran or Stitch data trying to sync between an event source and structured data in your data lake or data warehouse. And if fields are starting to be missing, you're going to miss columns, you're going to miss content in those columns uh, in your tables, right? Now, again, this is an issue that Datadog is not picking out for you. It's not telling you that a service is down, services are up and running, data is technically moving, but data is just not intact, right? Our columns are all populated with values or even more nuanced are values as expected. Right, so one of the examples that I didn't talk about is pricing errors, which we see very frequently in retail scenarios um, or that airline scenario I just talked about, right? Where um, let's say you are an international store and you're listing price of a, of a merchandise item in two different currencies. And now one currency is coming out correct. The other one is off by say a factor of 100 because in entering the conversion rate, you misplace the decimal point and now all dollar values have become cents. Right, so now you're maybe mispricing the product and pricing it up by a factor of 100x. So you can kind of imagine the impact that's going to create on sales, but that's a data quality issue too. Um, and is the data reconciling on towards the pipeline? When these data pipelines are actually complex, complex systems now, running through a lot of stages, transforming data from the head end to the tail end. What if data starts to be broken as it progresses? And so now you, in, you ingested 10 million transactions at the head of the pipeline. By the time you are presenting it to the CFO on a BI report, you are only left with 8 million transactions. So it's out. now you're just reporting an artificial loss in sale volume. Those are the issues that um, the IT monitoring tools are actually not catching for you, right? So you're basically ending up with this scenario where you have a good pipe carrying bad data. 
And this happens more often than we would like to, you know, we would like to acknowledge uh, because these pipelines are complex, right? Data can break at source or during ingestion or during transformation or even during presentation, right? And in a way such that the pipe, the infrastructure is healthy, but the content within that pipe is actually broken. So what that ends up kind of looking like is you have this infrastructure layer on top of which you have this data plane writing. Data plane here to me means where the content of data is being looked at, right? And you have a healthy infrastructure that's your pipe, um, which is carrying broken data on the data plane, right? But turns out this problem can actually be solved. Um, so despite um, kind of the grim picture that we are arriving at where data keeps breaking left and right across verticals and across um, segments of customers, um, it turns out that you can actually solve this problem if you just approach it the right way. So before we, we kind of go into the lack of tools, right, and, and what the solution needs to look like, let's understand why are we sitting in this white space right now while this is still going on as an open problem, right? Um, I've made a lot of progress in the data stacks. We talk about the modern data stack. I've been talking about it for the last 10 years, um, but we're still talking about this kind of gap in solving the data reliability problem. Why is that? Let me kind of just take you through a quick, uh, you know, chapter in history of, of the data stack. Let's take a step back and understand where we have come from in the last two decades or so. And so the first event of interest to me here is kind of three or four significant events that have happened um, in those last 20 years, right? So the first one to me is um, when we saw the cloud happen. And this is early 2006. The first mention I could find of when Amazon Web Services was launched. Interestingly, uh, just one month later is when Hadoop's first release was published on Apache Archive. Right, so you're talking about 2005, 2006, when cloud is being born and big data um, as defined by Hadoop in this case is starting to come to life, right? And the next kind of uh, big event, especially in the lineage of data that uh, data landscape that I'm getting at um, took place in around 2012, 2013, when cloud data warehouse started to be real. So the first announcement that launched Redshift came in uh, late 2012. And I think the first public release was made available in 2013, right? And then of course we know what followed is BigQuery and Snowflake and you name it. And it took some time for the world to kind of move its head around from uh, the ETL model of processing everything in memory where we used to say everything is going to become a streaming pipeline or at least everything will be processed in memory and you're just going to go from huge high volume data on the head end on a Kafka bus through a Spark processor running streaming and in memory, finally to finished metrics finally being written back to this, right? So that used to be the ETL model. And it took us some time to go from that model to what we now call ELT, which is a kind of linchpin of the modern data stack, right? Where the idea is we first persist all the data in the warehouse and then you think about who needs to consume it, how to transform it, how to make it into a finished product. So to me, those are like three or four big events um, that happened or at least started to happen around those dates, right? If you look back at the history of uh, tools in the data reliability and data quality space, most of those tools were actually built in what I would call the small data era. Right, the time before even Hadoop was around. Definitely before cloud was around, definitely before big data came about, right? We used to talk about a MySQL database, let's say with a spreadsheet worth of data, and that was it, right? There was no pipeline, there was no continuous flow of data. There was a data set on hand, that relatively small in volume, that someone would want to inspect interactively and analyze for data quality before deciding that this is fit for use, right? And you talk about a data steward who would be the expert at interpreting completeness of data or accuracy of data, for example. In between those two big events, kind of birth of big cloud or big data and cloud, as well as, um, and, and the other side of it where the cloud data warehouse happened and we moved to ELT, 
there was this phase of a good, I would say 10 years where we were dabbling with ETL and streaming and whatnot. And big data was happening. Data quality was a problem, but nothing actually really moved in terms of solving the problem. And the reason is that it wasn't actually clear how you would go about building a generic solution that could attach to any data pipeline, right? Because these data pipelines all look different in the ETL world. Um, you know, some, someone is using a Hadoop stack, someone is using a Spark stack, and data is all in memory. So there was no one place where you could just go and attach and say, this is where I'm going to integrate and test for data quality. What's happening now is the requirements are different and the landscape is also different. Now you have the data warehouse as a single source of truth, or at least one that we wish for it to be single source of truth. Right, so that now starts to look like a very tenable architecture where you have all the data in one place across the entire stage of the pipeline, right? Right from data getting collected, ingested, transformed, and then finally being served out. That could be three stages, that could be 20 stages, but it's all there in one place, right? So now there's actually both a need as well as feasibility of solving this problem. We kind of went from the small data era where we knew data quality is a problem. We found a way to solve it. And then we went through this dark period of about 10 years where we didn't know what to do about this problem, even though it was severe. And we're finally now coming again to a place where this can be solved, right? So what's changed about this problem, right? And what actually still makes it hard or what makes it way harder than it used to be? Why cannot we just lift the solution from the last generation and carry it forward. Well, the obvious one here is that data has scaled a lot, right? I mean, we're talking about two orders of magnitude growth in the last decade alone, right? And, and what that means is the way that shows up is you have a lot of data assets, you have high cardinality, right? So we're talking about monitoring thousands of tables of data. This is not just one spreadsheet loaded into one table. And then there's different cuts of data. You're slicing it 20 different ways. And then there are all the columns and finer grained uh, monitoring entities or elements that you want to track for data quality. So that's kind of one piece of it, high cardinality. And um, that not surprisingly, that comes with high data volume. So you're talking about billions of rows a day, right? That's, that's something you cannot even load in a spreadsheet anymore. And then you are seeing this very fast changing nature of the data model itself. You're throwing in new tables every week, maybe even every day. We are changing the schema of old tables. In fact, we're doing that silently where the data integration pipeline will just, will just alter your table schema um, if something changes in your unstructured data source, right? So that actually starts to change the problem a lot. Um, so the solution idea here, um, don't want to talk too much about the solution today in this session, but the solution idea here is um, with LightUp, we implement something called data quality indicators. So the idea here is just like KPIs measure the health of your business. And then we have built a lot of tools in the BI space to, to be able to construct and continuously track KPIs. The idea is that you can now do the same thing for data quality or data health, where you can think of DQIs. And then you can have DQIs be built in a way so that they're easy to turn on. They can compute at scale efficiently. They capture everything you want to measure about the health of data. And then you can have a workflow that can evolve as your data model evolves. DQIs come with you, right? So that's the core idea. I mean, if you look back at those um, definition or defining properties of data quality, and we talked about what data quality means and how it's different than infrastructure health, right? For every single indicator of data quality, you can kind of club it into either an availability DQI or a conformity DQI, right? So there's DQIs that you can construct or um, find out of the box in LightUp that will let you quickly set up data quality monitoring at scale in a manner that makes it actionable. And these DQIs at the end of the day are time series metrics that are continuously measuring this particular aspect of data quality or data reliability. Right, so it's something we have seen work well for monitoring infrastructure or application performance, the same idea. Just like you think of CPU as a metric or you think of sales volume as a KPI, you can now think of a data availability DQI. And in most cases, 
that's just a turnkey um, turnkey property to enable. There's no magic about it. You don't need to start from scratch every single time. You don't need to write any SQL. You don't definitely don't need to write any code for it. Um, so that's what LightUp is designed to build, uh, is, is, is built to solve, right? And the system is designed so that you can quickly set up DQIs, no matter what you're trying to measure um, from the data quality point of view. And then you can compute these in a scalable manner, right? So the system is built so it will leverage the scalable compute fabric of your data lake or your data warehouse, right? So the system never actually pulls out raw data. It's able to compute these DQIs in place which means that now the compute power is reused instead of creating another big data engineering problem for just monitoring data quality. And kind of the third component here is making it operational, right? As opposed to making it an analytical workflow. The goal here is to be proactive. You want the system to continuously track those DQIs and tell you when something breaks and then gives you, uh, and give you the tools to act on those issues, right? So that's exactly what LightUp is built to do. We don't just give you the tools to set up visibility for your data quality. We also tell you how to track it um, as data is evolving and how to act on incidents the system finds. So you have a continuous feedback loop in the system. You can come in and make this actionable. Right. Um, so that's all I really wanted to talk about today. Um, if this is a problem that speaks to you and uh, you're looking to solve, come attend our session in the afternoon or uh, visit our website or write to me at, at that email. Um, you know, we'd love to help you make data reliable. Hope you'll agree that one thing that we do need here is data reliability. Otherwise that entire investment in the data stack is all for nothing. Um, let us help you uh, get to data reliability. Thanks for your time. Send us questions and we'll be happy to take questions also after this session. Thank you.